Chapter 2 starts us on a journey that will be the main theme of this unit, biochemistry. We will begin with the simplest components of living things, atoms, and molecules. As in each chapter, I'm going to flash up the learning objectives for you to take a look at, and I strongly, strongly suggest that you go back and review these at the end. Now, life, the universe, and everything can be very broadly summed up in just two words. It happens. It is the matter, all of the stuff of the universe, and happening is energy, or all of the doing and interaction between those bits of matter. A very smart bit of matter named Albert Einstein happened to figure out that the story can be further simplified to just one word. It happens. Uh, perhaps you've seen his expression for this relationship, E equals mc squared, where m represents matter, E represents energy, and the c squared here is where they meet, namely in time. Sort of. Leaving Dr. Einstein behind for now, let's go back to it. Matter. Matter is stuff. All the stuff that you can see, like whatever device you're watching this on, and a lot of stuff you can't see, like the gases of our air. There are four phases of matter, but only three of these are common in the biosphere. Plasma is not biologically relevant, and if you contacted it, it would probably hurt or even kill you. And like life, matter can be categorized into elements. The ancients proposed the first set of elements, water, earth, fire, and air. Once the science of chemistry grew from alchemy, we found that these four elements could be broken down into simpler substances still. Modern scientists define an element as a substance which cannot be broken down by chemical means. A compound is a substance that is made of two or more elements in a fixed ratio. For example, table salt. For every atom of sodium, there is one and only one atom of chlorine. Each element has a chemical symbol of one or two letters. The first letter is always capitalized, and the second letter, if there is one, is always lowercase. These symbols often make sense to us as English speakers, though a few elements have symbols that are derived from their ancient names. Gold, for example, is AU, which should be easy to remember, from the Latin word aurum, which means gold. Please note that Auburn is the only school in the SEC whose name can be correctly spelled with chemical symbols. This is the periodic table of the elements which shows every kind of matter that exists in nature and a few that have been artificially produced by humans. So let's take a look at the periodic table and try to figure out what it's telling us. So we read from the top upper left here to right and then go down. You can see uh, in the upper left here that is hydrogen and then we go down. Uh, to the other side of the page when you find element number two, which is helium, then down we find lithium and beryllium and so on and so forth. Why does it have these pointy bits on there? Uh, it has to do with the arrangement of the subatomic particles. Uh, we're going to take a quick look at the letters and numbers and what they all mean. And to do that, rather than looking at this whole table, we'll just focus on one smaller bit. Okay. First thing, try not to get too distracted by the fact that it looks like it says bacon of knee. Uh, those are just the chemical symbols for boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon, respectively. Again, note that a chemical symbol is always one or two letters, the first one always capitalized, and if there is a second one, it is lowercase. The names of the elements, which you can see at the top, do not have to be capitalized. Under the name of the element, you can see the atomic number. What do you notice about these atomic numbers? Hopefully, you see that they are all whole numbers or integers and that they are increase in series by one. 
five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Contrast that with the numbers at the bottom of the boxes, and you should notice that the numbers at the bottom of the boxes are not whole numbers, but are rather decimal numbers, uh, what each of which usually comes very close to a whole number. For example, carbon is very close to 12, and nitrogen is very close to 14, and oxygen is very close to 16. These numbers are the atomic masses of these elements, which is the average mass of an atom of that particular element. So, uh, the word atom comes to us from a Greek, from Greek words atomos, which means uncuttable. Ancient philosophers reasoned that matter could, of an element uh, could be reduced or cut a finite number of times. and Eventually, there would be a quantity so small that it would be uncuttable and still behave in the same way. Uh, how small is that uncuttable thing? It took a very long while from the time of the ancient Greeks to develop a technology to determine that. When the tools became available, they found that the smallest uncuttable things were very, very small, and they were made up of three fundamental particles. Two of these are found in the central part of the atom, called the nucleus. Uh, the nucleons, or the nuclear particles, are protons and neutrons. They have a mass which is almost equivalent, about 1.7 times 10 to the negative fourth grams. So that's 1.7 over uh, a one with 24 zeros. Very, very, very small. And this amount is defined as one Dalton, named after the British chemist John Dalton, or just for fun, it has another name the AMU, which is the atomic mass unit. Electrons have a mass which is much smaller still. They're only about one two thousandth the mass of a proton. This mass is considered negligible. We don't count that when we are figuring out how much an atom weighs. Just for an example, imagine that a human weighs 100 kilograms. That's 220 pounds. We'll call that human proton. To proton, an electron weighs 50 grams. What's 50 grams? Uh, a golf ball is very close to 50 grams. So when proton steps on the scale and you toss them a golf ball, the scale isn't going to move all that much. So when we calculate the mass of an atom, we only count the protons and neutrons. More atoms, most atoms have more than one proton, and for each additional proton and neutron, imagine we're just adding another golf ball. It doesn't really add all that much, so negligible. Don't have to count it. But atoms are not just about mass, they are also about charge. Uh, protons have a positive charge and electrons have a negative charge. Neutrons, no charge. You may recognize this image as an atom with the protons and neutrons sitting in the nucleus and the electrons whizzing around the nucleus at amazing speeds. Remember, atoms are just a theory. Just kidding, of course, though this model is quite inaccurate for a number of reasons. Um, we shouldn't say it's just flat out wrong because an atom probably looks a lot more like this than it looks like a platypus or a burrito or a map of Australia, but it's inaccurate in some important wink ways. As you'll see, it's difficult to make sense of atoms visually. Atoms are mostly empty space. If we could expand a single hydrogen atom with one proton and one electron to the size of a football stadium, the proton would be about the size of a pencil eraser sitting on the center of the 50 yard line. And the electron would be about the size of a fruit fly, not, not a house fly, not even a a house fly, but those teeny tiny little fruit flies. Actually, it'd be even smaller than that. And it would be whizzing around all over the stadium, up into the bleachers, to the very tip top, everywhere. Uh, if it were a typical cesium atom, there would be a pile of 133 pencil erasers, and the fruit fly electrons, of which there'd be about 54, would be whizzing around everywhere in Jordan Hair, all the way out to Tumor's Corner. So that is a lot of empty space. But those flies are whizzing around so fast that you wouldn't want to be anywhere near this giant atom. 
Just as a fan is mostly space with a few fan blades, you wouldn't want to stick your finger in there. Or maybe you do, weirdo. Going back to those decimal numbers that we see on the periodic table, uh, the reason that these are not whole numbers but are very close to whole numbers, usually, is that they are averages. The atomic mass of an atom is determined by the number of protons plus the number of neutrons. So, just like saying that the average American family has 2.4 children, this doesn't mean that people are just hiding partial children somewhere. Uh, it just means it's an average. The same is true for atoms. All atoms have a whole number of protons and a whole number of neutrons. Any two atoms that have the same number of protons are, by definition, the same element. But the number of neutrons may vary. And these same proton, different neutron versions of the same element are called isotopes. As we can see in these three very inaccurate atom images, uh, three different isotopes of the element carbon. Carbon-12, over here on the left, has six protons, of course it has to, and six neutrons. And is far and away, this is the most common type of carbon atom in a typical sample of carbon. Carbon-13, in the middle here, has seven neutrons and is a stable isotope of carbon. It is rare in a typical sample containing carbon. Carbon-14 on the right here is even more rare, and it has eight neutrons. In addition to being rare, it is unstable and leads to another property of atoms, which is radioactivity. And notice that these symbols down here show how we indicate how many protons and neutrons there are in a particular atom. We don't often see the six with carbon here because when we say something is carbon, we mean that it has six protons, so it's kind of redundant. But uh, we can indicate that if there's a different number of neutrons, we put the total mass up as a superscript up here, so 12, 13, 14. Okay, so more about isotopes. Most elements have a couple of stable isotopes and a couple of radioactive isotopes. The radioactive isotopes undergo decay and lose particles. They may actually even lose protons, and you know what that means. It means they become different elements. Uh, and they release energy. Thank you, Dr. Einstein, for figuring that out. So this decay is what causes this effect called radioactivity. Now, radioactivity is normal and natural. It's nothing that we can do anything about, per se. Uh, the rate of radioactive decay is extraordinarily stable. You can set your watch to it, literally. The reason that every single clock can be synchronized in every cell phone is because of the standardization set by atomic clocks. We can measure radioactive decay with a Geiger counter, which is what that image in the background is, uh, named after its inventor. His name was Geiger. It doesn't count Geigers. Uh, at everyday background levels, radioactivity is useful to biologists because we can use the detectability to trace different chemical reactions. We'll definitely see some examples of that this semester. We can also use the consistency of the rate of decay to measure the age of fossils and other ancient items. At elevated levels, radiation is bad news. Uh, the power plants at Fukushima in Japan and Chernobyl in the Ukraine provide evidence for this, and nuclear weapons, in addition to their destructive explosive force, produce radioactive fallout that persists for years after their deployment and remains injurious for decades to come.